Now it's not just an Aberdeen player could play in my reserve team or whatever. It's one who can compete in finals at Hamden or win trophies, championship trophies. That's the kind of level or the standard we're looking for. And I know that you can never really tell at 13, 14, but you've got to be as sure in your mind as possible before you do that thing. I think a lot depends on the boy himself. If he has the ambition and the hunger to succeed, you generally find that they have a better chance. Um, if we can get a boy at 13, we can develop him in some ways in terms of his technical ability before he comes to us at 16. We go down to Glasgow once a month to coach our S-forms, and that is working well for us. And, of course, they come up here every holiday period. So that um, we are preparing them uh, long before they become full-time professionals. But there is a danger in professionalising a young player's instincts too early. Scottish football at its best has always resisted regimentation. It has been an irrepressible display of individuality, an unrehearsed expression of self, a subversive dance of Scottishness. Football has mattered to Scots precisely as a spontaneous declaration of identity. Jimmy Johnston's training of Celtic's S-form boys can only be good for the game. Two nights a week at Helenvale, he teaches them. It's not easy to see what a talent as unique as Jimmy Johnston can teach us, except that we will never be like him. But perhaps proximity to magic can have magical results. Certainly it should remind us that the game is about joy through controlled physical exuberance. Jimmy Johnston's teaching by example should be an effective antidote to some of the more mechanical aspects of the modern game. I think it's gone completely. I don't know, it's just, they're just like, really like robots. A lot of players are playing today. Because first and foremost thing you've got to entertain. You, you're uh, you're uh, an entertainer. And I think that to do that, I think you've got to practice at it. And that's what's missing. Go forward, well done, son. Hey, that right, fat early. Jimmy, switch it, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy. Jimmy, you, you've got to entertain. I think that's the most. I think that, that is the answer. That's what would bring people back in the game. Every kind of sport or anything uh, that you find somebody that's been successful in, you know, particularly sports, snooker or whatever you want to do, if you go and ask them, they'll say the, the very same. It's limited hours of just continual practice, practice, practice. That's, uh, that's the most. Where are these boys just now that I'm training? Uh, they're 16 years of age. I train them twice a week. But uh, what I'd like, like them to do, what I, I'd hope they would do is when they go away from here, I, I've asked them, I tell them that they don't do enough here, just be a couple of hours with me every night. I would want them to go. And they can do it, you know. And I just think, again, if they work at it really hard, as, I'm, as I've said, I think it's about their possibility. But if they don't, then they can forget it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, mate. Hope you get that. If the exciting individuality of players like Jimmy Johnson is ever truly finished, the basic quality of Scottish football will be finished as well. In striving to be modern, the game must stay true to its origins or lose its essential character. If the Scottish under-18 squad are an accurate indication, the omens are good. They have had considerable success in international competition. They have not only won often, but they have won with style. The young players have discovered early the way an ability to play football can widen the horizons of a boy's life. Iceland becomes a natural backdrop to a game. Much of their success is due to the knowledge, enthusiasm and vision of their director of coaching, Andy Roxburgh. He coaches them in more than football. Well, normally we're very successful, uh, but on occasion we've had a mishap. I mean, the, the stadium that's right behind us is an example of that. In a, an international youth match we held there some years ago, uh, the two teams were lined up before the game and they played at the Queen. And then there was a slight pause when the fellow up in the booth changed the record over uh, in order to play the Icelandic national anthem. And one of our players was so nervous about playing in this uh, youth international match. And I must remind you, of course, that there's about 10,000 people at this game and they can all speak English. So one of our diplomats 
uh, was so nervous about the start of this game, and in a slight pause as the guy was changing the record, he shouted at the top of his voice, let's get right into these bloody Eskimos. Now, for a start, uh, his geography leaves a lot to be desired, and secondly, his lack of diplomacy was most embarrassing to us. We are trying to develop uh, thinking, imaginative players of the kind like John Watt, Charlie Nicholas, uh, Paul McStay and so on. Uh, this young lad on this occasion, I'm afraid, was one of our failures. <laughs> if you were to ask me about the Scots and how they express themselves, I usually use the, and this will sound rather poetic, but I, I always quote the fellow J.B. Priestley, who said that football was both hurtling with conflict and yet passionate and beautiful in its art. Now, to me, that's Scottish football. It is passionate on the one hand, but it can also be artistic, in other words, very skillful, particularly with the individualist side of it. That, by the way, was a remarkable statement that to be made, especially as the guy was English. So, lad, in Italy showed me this one. Can't handle it, lads, but here we go. The first touch is the vital one. Roll it past the outside of your body, and then swing the leg round behind to get the ball. So from there, roll, flick, we're off. Gee whiz, third time was lucky. Go. What is most hopeful in Andy Roxburgh's training methods is that he sees such practice as a means towards self-expression, not as a substitute for it. There, jam, flick. You know, this is the way you bounce and you twist in the one movement. And then this lad, Nene from Brazil, he did this in the match when he was trapped in a corner. Here's what he did. He was trapped. He rolled the ball up his standing leg and volleyed it away. He went, whoop, pew, like that. Only his went about 30 yards. OK, you got the idea? Try. I know I'm called the director of coaching, but I don't particularly like the word, because uh, in Scotland it seems to suggest negative tactics and robot play and so on. And I would rather call it teaching. Now, education is about liberating people, freeing them. And that's my attitude. In other words, if we educate them well, then the players will make their own decisions in the game and they won't be looking at dugouts. So the idea behind it is that we should educate them in terms of their basic skill and their knowledge of the game. Feels jammed in. Now, flick. See the difference? Jam it, flick. Very good. Superb. Walter Smith will be pleased with you, right? Magnificent. Because he can't do it, right? And you can score goals, which he can't either. So watch, here's the ball, we get the touch cam, and we go, and we play it. You actually back heel it in the volley from the air. Right, try those as well. Many people will actually say to me, my counterparts in, in Europe will say to me, I just wish we could put that spark of enthusiasm into our players. It's the one great thing we have. It's because football is sort of loved by the community in Scotland. And your granny, your auntie, your uncle and so on would show you how to do various fancy tricks in the ball or would encourage you to go out and play in the street and so on. I mean, a number of the tricks, for example, I show kids now in courses. I mean, my uncle taught me to do them when I was nine years old. So it was informal education. It's a community thing, if you like. Whereas now we have swung away to more formal teaching of football. But that's mainly because the street environment really has disappeared because of the traffic problem. If you play keep you up in the street nowadays, you get knocked down by a juggernaut. It's as simple as that. Well played. Hold it up. Well, certainly a lot of young players are overplayed. Certainly at the ages of 13, 14 and 15. They're playing for a school, the boys club, the local amateur team, etc. I remember one boy in the under-15 school squad who played four times a week for four different teams. I would say that at the professional level, though, when they get to 16, 17 and 18, that that is uh, less of a problem because the clubs control it far more there. They'll play once or at most twice a week. I like the idea that our players are now in full time. Uh, I'm slightly worried about the lower levels where they are overplayed and also many of the instructions that are given that uh, some of the hysterical things that happen. Uh, I mean, my colleague Walter Smith with the under-21 team told me at an incident re recently in Dundee with a Sunday league game where the boys were only 10 years old, where the coach of the team literally ran through the back of the goals and cleared a ball off the line to save his team losing a goal. Now, that's the kind of hysterical behaviour you get with uh, people who are looking after younger kids in Scotland. Whatever changes are taking place in the game, Scottish football continues to generate a sometimes hysterical passion, and it continues to produce individually exciting players. Well, there's a great goal! Ali McCoist, right up the blue, right through the Celtic defence, 27 seconds. 